a good option is a bad strategy in this highly competitive world we live in. So when you stage an experience, your clients actually listen to your advice, act on it more, get the value from you, and value you more in the long run. But the question is, how do we create this experience for clients? Well, I've done a lot of research on this over the last few years in the area of financial advice and professional services. A few years ago, we started a study at Deeper Media. We ended up talking to 1,800 of your clients, people that hire financial advisors or tax attorneys or accountants. And what we were looking for is people that would not switch. We call it the 50-50 test. We'd ask someone, if an advisor came along and their fee structure was 50% cheaper, but their demonstrative track record was 50% better, would you switch? You'd be surprised. A lot of them would. But what we dialed into is that small cohort of people that said, nope, I wouldn't switch. I don't trust that. I trust my financial advisor. They're not just a financial advisor. They're a partner to me in my life. And they used the word essential to describe that person. And when we did the research, we compared. And what we found out is that being a good option is a bad strategy in this highly competitive world we live in. If you're responsive, if you know your product cold, if you're great at learning people's names and understanding which college their kids go to, that'll only get you to good option. But to make the leap to essential partner, you need insane people skills. When we interviewed these essential advisors that these clients would never fire, even under the 50-50 test, what we've learned is that what made them different is three things. They were a sounding board. Some people in our study said, I can tell my financial advisor things I can't tell my spouse or my best friend. And I can tell them that and know they won't judge me. I can tell them that and in the course of talking to them, I can learn something about myself I didn't even know. That's the sounding board. It's the most important element of the essential partner. The second thing we learned is that they are a connector of dots. And what I mean by this is that they understand that financial planning and wealth management is just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. I want to create a legacy. I want to achieve peace of mind. And they create a referral network of partners that can completely close that loop. The third element is that the essential partner is a fountain of knowledge. Every time you sit with them, you learn something. And by working with them, they don't just add value, they multiply your value. For the next few minutes, I'm going to unpack these for you based on our research and help you learn how to make that leap from optional to essential. There's an old saying Peter Drucker had that nobody wants to buy a quarter inch drill bit, right? They want a quarter inch hole. So, so when people come to you, they're not saying, I just want financial planning. What do they talk about? I want peace of mind. I want to create a legacy with everything that I've done. I want to create security for my family and my grandchildren. That's a higher order need. And what customer capitalism says is that our service is only one thing they need. If there's any other thing they need to achieve legacy, to achieve peace of mind, all these other needs, those are value gaps that competitors can drive a truck through. Think about a real estate agent. A real estate agent that's really connected with this idea, and they're getting lock on and referrals, they know you don't want to buy a home. You want to relocate your family and find new friends, right? You want to upgrade your lifestyle. And that's the higher order need. So that great realtor, they're going to have a mortgage partner. They're going to have a renovation partner. They're going to have the welcome wagon, help you pick the right private school to put your kids into if that's your goal. And they're going to surround this customer activity with what? Connections. And they're going to win you. <music> Letterman is known as the greatest networker in the history of the life insurance business in New York State. He and his partner in the early 1930s founded their little life insurance firm. And you've got to imagine, it must have been incredibly difficult to sell life insurance during the Great Depression. I mean, can you imagine? No one cares about life insurance when they're just trying to keep their homes or keep their apartments. And even making problems worse, Elmer realized they had no marketing budget for trolley car ads or direct mail. 
So around 1932, he made a decision to create his own grassroots marketing campaign. He called it becoming part of the solution. Every Friday, he would host a networking lunch at a downtown restaurant, and he would invite three people that should meet to come to his lunch. So for example, he might invite a chef who's out of work but has a great business plan, found an inexpensive property in the meatpacking district and already recruited three chefs to join him. And then the second person he would invite would be an investor who still is investing in 1932. They don't have alligator arms. Have you heard that phrase in investing? You watch the Discovery Channel, alligators are massive creatures, but when they raise them up, you notice they have little arms that can't quite get into their pockets. But he would find an investor who was still making investments in the right plan and invite them, that's the money piece. And then he would invite a construction executive with a great reputation to be the third piece. So he's got the entrepreneur, the money, and the builder, and that becomes Letterman's lunch. And he wouldn't sell anything during these lunches. He would focus them all on executing on the opportunity. When he would meet with the chef a year later with a line around the block, he wouldn't expect a free meal. When he approached them, he would ask, how did you do it? Because great networkers understand that introductions like this, they're just one step of the entrepreneur's arduous journey. He did this 50 weeks out of the year for 10 years, and then became featured in New York media as a decamillionaire who made his fortune during the Great Depression by helping people. And when you think about how he became so financially successful and grew his business so much, just do the math, the math of goodwill. You take three people and you put them together and you create an opportunity, you expect nothing in return. You multiply that times 50, you concentrate it in a community and compound it by 10, and what do you get? You get an entire community that won't do business with anyone but Elmer Letterman. Stop dreaming.